Welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and our connection to our own humanity. This is episode 64. It's another joint episode with Melita Thomas of Tudor Times, and it's on Bess of Hardwick. Just a quick note that the Renaissance English History Podcast is a proud member of the Agora Podcast Network. The Agora Podcast of the Month is the History of Egypt Podcast, which you can find on iTunes, any other podcasty sort of place, and EgyptianHistoryPodcast.com. So check that out. Remember, you can always get links to more information on each show, resources, and sign up for the mailing list for extra mini casts and goodies at EnglandCast.com. So moving on from that admin bit, let's talk a little bit about Bess of Hardwick. One thing about this episode is that Bess was the Tudor Times Person of the Month this month, but she's also someone I had done an episode on in October of 2015. So to avoid rehashing all of the basics of her life, we jumped right into talking about the roles women had with regard to land ownership, the way they could run their finances, and the options that they had as widows. To listen to the podcast on the basic facts of Bess's life, feel free to go back to the archive, and I'll also put a link on the show notes for this episode. So now let me introduce you to Melita Thomas of Tudor Times. Melita is a co-founder and editor of Tudor Times, a website devoted to the Tudor and Stuart history in the period from 1485 to 1625. You can find it at tudortimes.co.uk. Melita, who has always been fascinated by history ever since she saw the 1970s series Elizabeth R. with Glenda Jackson, also contributes articles to BBC History Extra and Britain Magazine. We started the interview with me asking Melita what made Bess so special and why she chose her as the person of the month. Can you tell me a little bit about Bess and why you chose her as the person of the month? Uh, Bess of Hardwick is perennially fascinating to people. She was married four times, uh, a, an early, well, not necessarily an early, but definitely a social climber of the Elizabethan age. She started out as a country gentleman's daughter and ended up as the richest woman in England after the Queen. So quite an interesting career. Mm. Um, she's the sort of person you think nowadays she'd be, you know, a captain of industry, uh, like some of the, the great women who run Yahoo and Google and prime ministers. And she's, she was a woman of enormous drive and intelligence and business sense. And you know, just just an interesting person to look at and see that ne women weren't necessarily these downtrodden creatures that you know, that probably most of them were, but it didn't it wasn't always like that. And there were women who did use their talents to to get ahead, and not just the talent of who who they slept with. I mean, obviously she chose her husbands carefully, but she made money out of her land, and she made money out of. Her, her estates in a way that a number of her male counterparts at the time just failed to do. So yeah. It, and it, it was interesting. One of the things that I really find fascinating about her is how she had to fight for so much with her widow's rights. She had to go to court and, um, you know, take matters all the way up, you know, to, to the queen when she needed to. And yeah. I just wonder if you can tell me a little bit about, it, it seems like she just, she didn't take things sitting down and that's what I like about her. And, um, you know, can, I think there's stuff to talk there about there with what widows were meant to receive and how they were able to receive them and then how they would navigate life after their husbands passed. Yes. Well, marriage of course was, uh, it was an economic decision and going, going into marriage was like forming a business partnership. Uh, generally, you know, spouses would be chosen for you by your parents. I mean, people did have an, an element of choice. They weren't generally forced to marry somebody they, they really didn't like or, or couldn't get on with. But conceptually, you know, that, that was how society worked. Your parents chose you a, a spouse and, and you married them. And they chose the spouse usually for economic reasons. So a woman would have a dowry, uh, which was usually cash or goods, occasionally land but generally generally cash and Bess who was a country gentleman's daughter not not wealthy by any means her dowry was somewhere between 40 and 60 marks 
Now, a mark is about two thirds of a pound. So somewhere between sort of 25 and 40 pounds was her, her cash inheritance from her from her father. Um, so it, to, to give you a, um, a sort of a comparator, although it's, it's very difficult because purchasing power is different, uh, a duke, the, du- the Duke of Buckingham had in 1521, he had an annual income of about £3,000 a year. Uh, when Anne of Cleves was had her marriage annulled, her settlement from the king was somewhere between three and £4,000 a year. Mm-hmm. And Henry VIII left his daughters an annual income of £3,000 a year. So with Bess having a, a lump sum of 30 to £50, that, that gives you the the sort of idea so a good deal more than a you know what you might call an ordinary working person would ever have but by no means vast wealth mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so Bess's first husband was a chap called Robert Barlow or Barley it's sometimes written uh, who was another man from Derbyshire about the same sort of age possibly slightly younger than Bess and we don't know anything about how the marriage was arranged uh, but what was interesting about it is that uh, Robert was a minor so he was under the age of 21 at the time of his marriage and he was also a he was a ward of court his father had already died so it's it, it, it's very complicated the, the arrangements around it no it isn't absolutely clear how the marriage was arranged so when Robert died quite quickly after the marriage probably about 18 months it's unlikely that uh, they had consummated the marriage. It's, it's possible, but he, they probably had, and they were probably considered too young. So Bess, whose dowry of, say, £50 had been handed over to the Barlow estate, was in theory due a third of his income for life as her dower. Mm-hmm. So there's there's three elements to it. There's the dowry that the wife pays over the family, and that money becomes the property of the husband's family, just goes into the family pot. Mm-hmm. Then there is the second element, which is usually referred to as the jointure, and that was the money on the lands that the husband and wife had for their joint lifetime to live on. So frequently, if... Uh, a son married during the lifetime of his father he would settle land and income on the son and son and the wife and that was that was a jointure or for for royal women that was their the jointure that that um was given to them so like the queens had you know their four thousand pounds a year of land and so forth mm-hmm. and at the death of the husband or the death of the, the wife um but so so at the death of the husband the the jointure didn't necessarily then stay with the wife sometimes it did sometimes it didn't because she was entitled to a thing called the dower so it's a separate concept and the dower was generally about a third of the annual income that the couple had enjoyed okay so if he didn't leave a will if the husband left no will the wife would get a third of the family estate and income for her lifetime Mm mm-hmm and so a couple, I, I was just thinking about her first marriage. Didn't she have to go to court to try to get that? She, absolutely. So when, when, Bess, when Bess's husband died, uh, the, the guardian who was administering the lands refused to pay the dower, probably on the basis that the, the marriage hadn't been consummated. It was all just hadn't, they, they were all very young and, you know, all, all the sorts of excuses that people come up with to not pay the money over. And he probably thought that Bess, as a girl of, you know, maybe 16, wasn't going to do anything about it and that she would just put up with it because she didn't have rich or powerful friends to help her. And that was the that was the key in Tudor life. You needed powerful friends. It was all about networking. If you knew somebody who knew somebody, they could fix it for you. Mm-hmm. But Bess, as a young girl, didn't have that. And you can look at how this experience really marked how she, her her subsequent career. She became an absolutely expert networker. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, a presidential candidate is nowhere near as good as Bess was at networking. She was just amazing at it. Mm -hmm. And she obviously worked out that that's what she needed, powerful friends. So, but even before she, she attained these skills, she, she said, no, I want my dower. And she went to court and a settlement was forced upon her that wasn't, um, 
you, you know, her full rights in, I think, 1548, I think, which was uh, two or three years after her husband's death. But she continued to fight on. And in 1553, um, she got the full settlement of a third of her first husband's estate. And she would hold that for life. Now, you can see why um, these problems arose, because, for example, if a man had married several times, and most people did because of, because spouses, you know, everybody died quite, quite young, mm -hmm. uh, a husband might have, say, a third or a third wife right. who might be the same age as his son. And when his son inherited, he was going to have to pay his stepmother a third of his income for perhaps the rest of his own life. Right. So it was a huge drain on estates. And there was a lot of feeling that they shouldn't, you know, a lot of resistance to paying it. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I could see, like, if he married three, well, I suppose, yeah, I could see where you would start to divide things up, and, and pretty soon um, it, it would all be divided up, yeah. especially if uh, you had, I guess, how would it work with, for second sons and for third, because I could see this if a family had multiple sons, how would that work? Exactly. So the, the younger sons had even less chance of getting any money if they if they had a stepmother who was as old as them. Mm -hmm. So generally, the way lands were held, it, most lands um, were, were held by men. Uh, and things never change, do they? Mm -hmm. And on the man's death, it was complicated as to whether as to whether land could actually be um, passed by will, because in theory, land belonged to the king. OK. And. Well, the crown. So, uh, and at the top of the, the of, of the feudal pile, so to speak, the king gave land to his feudal barons in return for service, and the feudal barons gave land to the people under them in return for military service, and so on. It went down down the the, the hierarchical tree. So, if when you inherited you were a minor, you couldn't give that service. So, the land reverted to the crown in theory, and when you reached the age of 21, you were allowed to swear out your livery and take your land back. But it's it's not clear that land really belonged to an individual. I see. So, uh, so generally, how how land was 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 granted. So, for example, the king, you know, gave um, a thousand, uh, you know, a thousand acres, shall we say, to the to the Earl of Salisbury, and the in return for service. And then the Earl of Salisbury might divide that up into 10 farms of, of 100 acres each. And that 100 acres would be granted to the individual and his heirs. Now, sometimes it was as long as they performed the service. So sometimes it would say the heirs male, mm -hmm. which meant it was only the sons. And sometimes it would just said the heirs, which meant if there were no sons, the daughters could inherit. And that's kind of like to the um, the agreement or the the device for the succession that Edward VI had done with, with Jane, Lady Jane Grace saying the heirs male, right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. He tried to entail it on, on, on male heirs and the crown. Well, again, there was, there was arguments about whether the crown could be willed in, in any event, but, mm -hmm. but yes, it, it had never been in tail mail. So it had always been to the heirs general and, mm -hmm. and some of the oldest, older estates, which, which this answers the question that people often ask is how come sometimes women inherited, say the earldom of Salisbury, there were, there were countesses of Salisbury and countesses of Warwick, but not other ones. And in the early days of, uh, of the feudal, sort of system after the Norman conquest, it generally the the entails were not were not limited to males. It was just usually the heirs. Mm -hmm. So the older um titles tended to be heritable by women. But towards the fourteenth, fifteenth century they started limiting it to male heirs. I see. Okay, and we we could go on for a long time about this. We could, yes. Yeah. So, so, so sorry, I digress somewhat. No, so no, no. I, it's <laughs> really interesting. Um, uh, so the thing, one of the, of course, main 
um, factors in Bess's life was her husband and her were in charge of um, kind of being the guardians of Mary Queen of Scots later on when she was on her fourth mm-hmm. husband. And <laughs> I just wonder how she at that time, she wasn't under any obligation to be with Mary Queen of Scots. And so she was able to start a lot of building projects and go and and her marriage was quite strained then. Can you tell us a little bit about what was going on with her later in her life and how I guess quickly how she got to that point and then a little bit about what was going on with her then. Yeah. So after her first widowhood, she married again, Sir William Cavendish, by whom she had uh, quite a few children. And they were definitely a business partnership, although there was a big age gap. And in order to avoid the problem of underage heirs and losing control of the estates, all the Cavendish's lands were held it jointly for Bess's for for the life of the survivor. So when Bess outlived him, instead of the lands immediately passing to their children, she held them all personally, which was unusual. Mm-hmm. So that so um, the, there were complications when he died because he was under investigation for embezzlement, which he probably had done. I think I think a lot of money stuck to William Cavendish's fingers over the years. That mm-hmm. uh, she married a third time, uh, William St. Lou. And inherited a, a money and land from him as well. Again, held held for life, and then she made this spectacular match to George Talbot, uh, Earl of Shrewsbury, who had recently been widowed. They were they were about the same age, and it would appear, um, you know, deeply. Uh, he, he he seemed very much in love with her when they married. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, there's some beautiful time- love letters from that. Yeah. From that, yeah. Yes, and he called her my, you know, dear sweetheart, and and he his his nickname for her was, uh, it's spelt none n o n e, but uh, I it probably came from my own, so mm. my known. Yeah. So he writes these letters to her saying he misses her, and uh, one in particular he he misses her at night, so so we can infer that they were they were well well matched. Yes. Um. So yeah. So it was, so. And he he didn't need to marry uh, again, or because he'd he'd been married for twenty odd years to his first wife and had numerous children. Uh, but you know she she had plenty of money, and as is was the custom, of course, when they married, unless other arrangements were made, he would have the control of all of her land and property mm-hmm. for her lifetime. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. And much of the lands that she held were in Derbyshire and, and many of the Shrewsbury lands were in Derbyshire as well. So it all all matched together quite nicely. And, they and didn't she the, marry her children to his children as well to really try and solidify? It, exactly. And this, you know, it, I mean, it was suggested afterwards that this was all sort of some sort of scheme on her part to steal the Shrewsbury inheritance. But in fact, it worked for both parties because the oldest son of... Uh, um, Bess, Henry Cavendish, married one of Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury's daughters. So he would give, Shrewsbury would give Grace Talbot a, a dowry and, you know, she would take that to the Cavendish family. And at the same time, uh, one of Bess's daughters, Mary Cavendish, married uh, Shrewsbury's second son. His, his elder son was already married. And that would give um, the second son some some money and lands as well. So, so it was a good deal for everybody. Mm-hmm. And although um, uh, Mary Cavendish and George Talbot, they they got on very well, Henry and Grace didn't actually have any children in the end. So f- so from that point of view, it was it was a dynastic failure, and it, it was Grace's fault because Henry, Henry had so many illegitimate children that he was known as the the common bull of Staffordshire and Derbyshire. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, so it was a good business arrangement as well, the ma- marriage with Shrewsbury. But they were, you know, certainly Shrewsbury was was very attached to Bess. Harder to tell what she thought because her letters are less personal than his. Mm-hmm. But along comes Mary, Queen of Scots, <laughs> and well, it, it it would put a strain on any marriage. And they hadn't been married um, very long. They'd been married, uh, I think, two or three, about three years, when uh, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, decided that. Uh, Mary was never going to go home again and the best person to keep her in honourable confinement was the Earl of Shrewsbury Mm -hmm. partly because he was very rich um, and of course that had been helped by by his marriage to Bess and 
he was strategically placed in the Midlands, so not too close to the north where there was a big Catholic um, population who were certainly sympathetic to Mary, even if they weren't necessarily going to, um, you know, get to, to really rebel to any great effect that you know there was a lot of sympathy and certainly a high possibility that she could have escaped mm -hmm. obviously Mayor elizabeth didn't want her hanging around london um partly because mary was uh, famously beautiful and charming and elizabeth <laughs> didn't like competition um so so the shrewsbury's in in the midlands or derbyshire were absolutely ideal location and also um shrewsbury and bess were very firmly Protestant, mm -hmm. no, no, no possibility of them, um, you know, getting involved in any kind of Catholic plots. Mm -hmm. And Shrewsbury, he, you know, you, you get the impression that he, the, the poor chap was a bit of a fuss pot. Um, but the, the risk he ran was huge because if Mary had escaped, uh, you know, a very, very high possibility that he would have been blamed right. and we know what happened to noblemen who pissed off the king or the queen it you know it, it wouldn't have ended well if if mary had escaped and, and there were rumors about him not doing such a good job towards the end were, weren't there that it put him under a lot of stress weren't there and, and he couldn't like go to court to try to address them because he was uh, stuck there and he, yeah so so he was not supposed to leave her at all he had to ask for special permission to to leave her so that meant that unless Bess was prepared to be there all the time um you, you know they she the couple began to spend time apart because Bess you, you know she didn't want to be confined with a, a, a load of guards um, right. hanging around the castle not able to you know live a free life so she wanted to attend to her her estates and her business and her children and Shrewsbury couldn't couldn't get involved he, mm -hmm. he was stuck looking after Mary mm -hmm. and his he, he was very very stressed and you can see a deterioration in his character from somebody who was very attached to his wife to Somebody became very suspicious. Very, he thought she was um, trying to rob him. He thought she thought he thought that she hated him. He, I, I think the stress. I mean, looking, you, you know, you can't tell medically at this distance. I, I would say he certainly uh, could well have had um, the kind of strokes that alter people's personality. You know, they get very um, difficult and stressed and um, paranoid behavior, and he you know he accused he he accused her of um trying to uh, for, uh, uh, uh forcing him into monetary agreements that that when when he was ill mm -hmm. and his own son who was uh, uh, the second son actually I, I called the second son george he's actually gilbert gilbert okay. um gilbert and mary who tended to side with Bess when when she and Shrewsbury quarrelled? He he accused his daughter-in-law of trying to poison his son's mind against him. Mm -hmm. uh, so poor fellow, he, he got very yeah. very worked up. Um, and Mary, of course, you know, you know, it was in Mary Queen of Scots' interest to sow dissension because, it, well, apart from the fact the poor woman must have been bored out of her mind, she was only in her in her late twenties when she was confined. And she was never, you know, ne never to be freed again. I mean, no wonder she was she was busy plotting. Right. Uh, you, you know, you can hardly blame her. So if she could sow a little bit of dissension and make everybody's life difficult, you know, she, Why she not? did. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sheer entertainment value, if nothing else. Yeah. So that must have been very hard for Bess to watch all of this and watch the deterioration of her marriage and um, her husband becoming so stressed. And uh, how did she handle that? Yeah, she, as far as you can tell from the letters, she seems to have been genuinely concerned about her husband and wanted to be reconciled and persistently uh, said, because uh, at one time he, he, she went off to visit Chatsworth, as she'd customarily done. And it seems, it, it seems odd that she didn't just go back home to uh, Sheffield Castle or, or, or wherever Shrewsbury was at that time. But whether she she needed his permission to move, as wives obviously did need their husbands' permission for a lot more things, he he didn't give her permission to come back home. Mm. So he he sort of instituted this separation, and she 
wrote to him and saying, you know, let me come home. I'm, you know, I want to help you. I want to look after you. I, I, I don't know why you're so angry with me. Tell me why you're angry with me. And he would all he would do is say, you know why I'm angry with you. You've behaved appallingly. And she'd write back and say, but what have I done? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's it's very it's very sad because obviously he he ha- he had a complete bee in his bonnet that she'd done something, but he'd never tell her what it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, and. There were a number of efforts to reconcile them. The Earl of Leicester tried to help them um, be reconciled, but Shrewsbury just just yeah. be in his bonnet, poor fellow. So let's talk about what happened with her when once he died, and she was she never married again, and she focused on her building projects, and also. The theme of her as a as a dynasty creator, um, you know, with her granddaughter Arbella, and isn't it like the all the queens and kings of England kind of descend from her in a way now? Is that true? Did I? Uh, no, because okay. her her granddaughter Arbella didn't have any children of her own. Okay. I so guess. I mean, some of them. I mean, there are definitely descents. Uh, the Cavendish family, yes, they're in. In fact, our, our current queen is descended from her right, because okay. uh, her her grandmother was a Cavendish. Yes, yeah, so that's what a, a Cavendish I... Bentinck. Yes, yeah. So from Bass. Yes, yeah. yes. So she is descended, and some some of the other have, but but through the through the sort of Cavendish ch- children marrying into other members of the nobility rather than a sort of a direct. I see. Um, descent but yes the, the current queen is, is definitely descended from her and the i i feel you you kind of touched on it where people talked about her last marriage like she was trying to get in on this family and i feel like there's such a double standard with her and i don't want to <laughs> yeah. you know i don't i yeah. don't mean to turn this political but you know when it when you look at men founding dynasties it's like oh look at them they're so strong but if you it, it's almost like a negative for a woman to be to be seen in this way and uh at the time period especially and she fought against so many stereotypes of what women I suppose should do and um I without it becoming too political I just wonder if you can talk a little bit about that and you know kind of about her legacy she yeah she definitely she's she was definitely one of those women who uh, women people who who was driven to succeed and I think it's probably because um you know sort of some pop psychology you know how I love my pop psychology Mm -hmm. um her childhood was insecure. Her father died in debt. Her mother lost most of her land. Bess became one of those people who totally um, looked for, for financial security. Mm-hmm. Everything she did was driven by her need for financial security. Now, that doesn't make her a, a bad person. And you can see, I mean, it's it has been shown that many, many great sort of um, – entrepreneurs and driven people have had financial insecurity in their childhood it's it's a very common Mm -hmm. behavior pattern and for 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 the Tudor mind it wasn't just about money it was about land Mm -hmm. and it was about holding land and it was about passing your land on to your to your children and that's what Bess and and her second husband Cavendish obviously had in mind they aggregated all their lands together which was unusual. A lot of a lot of big families had lands all over the place, but they they concentrated very much in Derbyshire, uh, round Chatsworth and uh, Hardwick, which is Bess's was where Bess was was born and brought up. Mm-hmm. So so they had a big concentration of lands there. The dynastic marriages with the Shrewsburys obviously um, w- was part of the great scheme, uh, and the most. The most wonderful dynastic match of all was the marriage of her daughter Elizabeth Cavendish to Charles Stuart, uh, who was um, Charles Stuart. He was he was the son of uh, Lady Ma- Margaret Douglas, and he was the brother of Henry Darnley. Mm-hmm. So he was Mary Queen of Scots' brother-in-law. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this marriage, which unsurprisingly didn't go down too well with Queen Elizabeth, mm-hmm. uh, potentially made Bess's grandchild. Elizabeth's heir. Now, had there was only one child born of the marriage, uh, Elizabeth um, was, was, as I say, not not very happy. Unfortunately, for, for probably for his head, Charles died young. But uh, it, had had the daughter Arbella been a boy, I think there's a very there's certainly been a strong possibility that he might have inherited 
rather than James of Scotland. Mm-hmm. So, so Arbala had a very, very genuine claim to the throne. It wasn't as good as as James of Scotland's, but obviously, it, it was a it was a card to be played. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But in a way, it sort of backfired on Bess that one because she was very loyal to Elizabeth, and there is no evidence at all that Elizabeth uh, quarrelled with Bess. Uh, it, it's often said that they did, but n- n- none of the biographies I've read about her or any of the evidence I've seen. Uh, suggests that this is this is at all true Mm -hmm. uh so so Bess was very loyal um but obviously she wanted her she her granddaughter was now you know had royal blood and she would like to have seen her at least considered by Elizabeth but Elizabeth she invited her to court a couple of times but uh she didn't she didn't take to her or she felt she'd be too much of a rival so she spent most of her her youth with her grandmother and Bess was then in a cleft stick because if she, if she let Arbella, um, there was, there was a strong possibility, or at least in, in the queen's mind that Arbella might be used against her, that she might become the focus of plots and rebellions and possibly even be abducted. I mean, there was talk Mm -hmm. that someone, she was going to be abducted to Spain. So Bess effectively had to guard the child as though she was a prisoner. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, it destroyed their, their relationship because Arbella, it, it drove her, you know, out of her wits to, to, yeah. to be guarded all the time. Although, mm. you, you know, you can say, actually, it probably wasn't a lot more serious than most young women were subject to. I mean, women, you know, their lives weren't very free. Mm. Um, but Bess... And again, having having established the dynasty, she she was sorry that obviously her older son Henry didn't have children, but um, she called him her my bad son Henry because he 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 got into debt, mm. and she much preferred well not necessarily preferred, but her second son William was much more like her, very careful, looked after his money, um, was a was a suitable heir, mm-hmm. and because Henry didn't have children, in fact, it all went to William, but. Um, Bess used money con- to control the family. Mm-hmm. I mean, she would be generous to Henry and her other son Charles, but she wouldn't pay their debts. She'd give them presents, but but she wouldn't pay their debts. And mm-hmm. you know, maybe I'm not saying she should, but mm-hmm. you can see. I don't know if you ever read Agatha Christie books, <laughs> but you you know you often see these sort of matriarchs in her books who hold on to the purse strings, um. and all the young people are, are sort of trapped yeah. i mean obviously with your modern mind you think well just go and get a job then but and, and i could really see it's, it's a very similar sort of plot in a way that there's bess holding the purse strings they have to come to her for money and she loves them and she's generous extremely generous gives a lot to her children gives a lot to charity but she controls the whole the whole thing she can't let go mm-hmm but she did create a fabulous dynasty and fabulous houses mm-hmm. um Hardwick Hall is, you know, just a gem of Renaissance architecture. Mm-hmm. Just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And Chatsworth, you can't see what Bess is Chatsworth. It's it's hidden now between between the modern, well, behind the 18th century Chatsworth. But you know, she created she created great art in in that way. Mm. What so, a lady! And, I love yes, her. yeah, she was, and her pearls. Have you have you seen the pearls in her picture? Yes. Seven strings of pearls. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> glorious. And she loved she loved beautiful things, beautiful tapestries, beautiful clothes. She paid for quality. Yeah. She was no, nothing miserly about her. You can see when she took Arbella to court, uh, you know, nothing but the best. Sure. Great. Well, thank you so much for telling us more about her. I um yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, yeah, no, she's take my hat off. She's somebody I I wouldn't cross her on a business deal, right. but she was honest. You you know you yeah. can see she'd hold people to the letter of the deal. Yeah. So she was she was hard, but she was, you know, she was she was a great businesswoman. Fair <laughs> enough. Good for her. Yeah, good, good for, for her. her. <laughs> Thank you again to Melita Thomas for taking the time to tell us about Bess of Hardwick. For more information on her, go to tutortimes.co.uk. Or you can also see the resources available on the EnglandCast site at englandcast.com. I'll be back in a couple of weeks with the final episode of 2016. It's going to be on cosmetics and makeup in Tudor and Elizabethan England. So that's going to be fun. 
Last year, to start off the year, I did a few shows on the Spanish Armada, and this coming year in early 2017, I'm going to be focusing the first couple of shows on War with France, because it seems like a good adage for Tudor England was, when in doubt, make war with France. So there's a lot of other good stuff coming up in the next year as well. Thanks so much for listening. I will talk with you soon. Closing time. Do, 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 do. Okay.